So let me share first share screen and then uh, Uh, already half almost halfway through the module hope you enjoyed it so far and today we basically start with what i think is the central object in astronomy the stuff that really shines stars we're going to talk today about the nursery where are they born their birth and some types of stars. Well, whether we make it to hydrogen burning and the structure, let's see. But we are going to explore a bit what are the conditions, how a star is born. And where are they? Where does this happen? And maybe next time you look in the night sky, you will find a couple or one or two of these regions. So the picture that I have here, <laughs> this has been taken by this uh, ALMA, so Atacama Large Millimeter and Submillimeter Array, it's radio waves and uh, the words microwaves, relatively cooled radiation, but to quite a uh, uh, detail. And it's an absolute stunning photograph. So they obviously made the hotter regions yellow and the cooler region when we start a red. So as usually uh, what we have been trained to think about colors. It's a question whether this is a natural feeling or whether we just have culturally back biased to feel so. And it basically shows us a protoplanetary disk around HL Tauri. So something in Tauri and then this H, I think L is the, uh, the, the A, B, C, D, or alpha, beta, gamma, is then also the brightness of the object. And what do we see here? Basically a star system in labor. That's a disk of hot gas, comparably hot already. And some, something must have already collected stuff away. So, absolute amazing photograph. But I want to today talk more about stars and planetary systems comes in lecture 11, 12. And there we will come back to this picture. So let us first start with what does a star consist of? Our sun. If we take a look at and, and split the light up and its fractions, we might see there are certain, again, uh, emission lines that we can associate with certain chemical elements. Then we see it's mostly hydrogen and a bit of helium. But this is then already atomic lines, that means uh, Hydrogen is basically the nucleus is one proton and one electron that forms hydrogen. But if it's very hot, if we have everybody emits this radiation spectrum, a Planck spectrum, and if it's very hot, we remember what happens this high energy tail, this uh, high freak or short wavelengths tail is the high energy. There might be photons around that are sufficiently to dissociate the atom. That means we have then a positive charged proton, negative charged electron. So how would we expect the star to be? Well, in the inner there are probably so much inner if you think about diving when you dive. What happens to the pressure on your ears? The deeper you go, the higher is the pressure. 
And the same is true for the star. So in this center, there might be pressures, but we would think everything must be liquidified, every gas, or even a, a solid state must form. But it's not exactly the case. What there, what we have there is it's what is called a plasma, which is an ionized gas. So we have these four, three forms of matter that we know from school, liquid, solid, gas, and the gas. And then if we make it to, to divide the gas atoms, molecules that give away electrons, and we have the positive charged ions left, we would call, call it plasma, the fourth state of matter. Meanwhile, mankind was quite uh, successful. We have created the fifth state of matter, which is called the Bose-Einstein compensate, named after Nathaniel Bose, an Indian physicist, and Albert Einstein, a uh, Swiss physicist. Okay, so <clears throat> it's which and the plasma is mainly built up of hydrogen and traces of he or far less helium. And if we look into other star newer generation stars, we also find traces of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and other heavy elements. But mainly it's ionized gas and they are hydrogen and helium. That means in order to form a star, what do we need? Exactly, yes. We need regions in space where we have a certain amount of gas around that if we contract the, the, the gas cloud, there is enough stuff there to form something that usually will need seven to eight percent of the mass of our sun that we can really speak of a star. A self luminous object that produces energy by the mean of nuclear fusion. That was the definition in the very first lecture. And in order to have this nuclear fusion, we're going to learn next week this. You need a certain pressure in the center. So, well, a gas usually contains atoms and molecules. This is what we know from school. And they basically move randomly through space. And if we cannot do not contain it somehow, the gas would quickly disperse and mix up, of course, with the atmosphere. Our atmosphere is just bound by the gravity of Earth. Now you know why Mars, who is a far, far smaller Mars, has a far less dense atmosphere. Jupiter, who is a much bigger Mars, has a far, den far denser atmosphere. It's just gravity. That avoids that a gas particle can move out into space. So they move usually randomly through space and occasionally they collide. So these are not hard spheres. These are basically soft stuff that the electron can be excited. But they would quickly re-excite, emit light, etc. So another thing what happens there is a statistical distribution of the kinetic energy. What means a certain amount of gas molecules have, is slow, a certain amount is, is me, medium fast, and, uh, yeah, and some are speeding. It's a bit like drivers. Some are caref too careful, some are reasonable, most of reasonable, and some are complete idiots. Okay, so every gas will, given it, certain temperature and then we leave it alone, it will adopt a certain velocity distribution, which is called after James Clark Maxwell, a Scotsman, and Ludwig Boltzmann, an Austrian lab, 
a Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. It looks a bit like a Planck distribution for photons. So if we plot the speed and here the number of molecules with this given in a given interval, then we get this characteristic distribution, which is mathematically described by the mass over. You remember KB? This is this Boltzmann constant. KBT, this was basically the energy that is associated with a certain heat to bring a body on a certain temperature T. To a certain heat energy, KBT. And then we see here this V squared dependency that describes here this parabolic rise. And we get here this dropping exponential function. Then we have a kinetic energy, m v squared half, kinetic the energy that is in the movement, renormalized for this thermal energy. This gives us this description of this stuff. And what means our velocity distribution is basically dependent on the temperature. So that's it. And there we can associate with a given velocity distribution, we could also uh, turn the argument around and give a given velocity distribution, we have a certain temperature, I guess. Wow. And then they will emit a certain Planck spectrum, depending on the temperature. So the temperature can also be related to some kind of average speed, which is in such a non symmetric distribution, of course, a bit towards where the long tail is, because this is, you know, even weighted with V squared. If you integrate over them. So every gas with a given temperature behaves this way. If it's a higher temperature, then what happens, of course, we have the, the, the centroid or the, the most problem the, the, everything is shifted towards the right side towards higher in, uh, velocities. This is basically low temperature, high temperature. The shape is the same, it's just shifted them. Or, oh, and if we go to very, very low temperatures, there will be all just in one state, depending on the type of, of molecule. This is now very interesting. If the molecule atom has an integer spin, integer type of rotation, intrinsic rotation, there will be all in one state. If not, there will be only one in one quantum state if there is a half integer spin quantum statistics but this is at so low temperatures no, who cares so otherwise we have this maxwell boltzmann distribution so it means we have a certain temperature we have a certain velocity distribution and then well the next thing is to consider gas will always work towards the outside. It wants to expand. It wants to take the maximum volume or it wants to minimize the probability to find a given molecule in a given volume. That is called entropy. Strange quantity. I cannot say I understand it. I accept that at some point this probability interpretation Well, and every gas follows also what is called the common gas equation. A real gas, there is a slight modification. This is now an idealized gas. So the temperature, again, we have a KBT. What means that, that the energy content in the movement or the heat content multiplied with N, the number of particles. For each particle, you have a certain quantum of energy, and now you multiply, you get the total. Okay. And this corresponds also to the number of particles, constant, and the temperature. So obviously, N, the total number of particles and Kb, these can be related to this uh, number of particles in moles, so 
in packages of six point something, 10 to the 23 particles. Quite a big package. I deploy it with different constant, but essentially it's the same. So what we have here, this is the number of particles. I deploy it with the temperature and that equals the pressure multiply the volume. So you have a given a vessel with a given volume, and then you measure the pressure the gas has towards the outside, works towards the outside. What means the force per area, or force per, per surface area, then you have uh, well, this, this product here. And this product also considers obviously to some kind of, of, of energy that is stored in the gas must be you have here heat kbt so an energy content multiplied with the number of parts then the overall but what we now establish here for given volume this temperature also considers to a certain pressure it works towards the outside and pressure is nothing else than force per area you can use the same force Press against the the, 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 the the table with your thumb. You have quite a big area. You take a nail and press on this and a very small area on the tip of the nail, and you will see you make a mark in the table and whoever paid for the table will be very angry. I usually well on the other side of the table is usually where my son sits when he eats. And oh, good if you buy your table in a, in a charity shop second hand where there are already marks in it, you don't mind so much. Oh, but the essential thing is now we can basically relate the pressure with the temperature. Okay. But essentially, to come back after this excursion to small gas theory. In order to form a star, we need gas. And best, we have regions with enhanced gas density. Nebula. So regions where we have larger amounts of gas available. And then what we might have, well, this here is basically a diagram showing you different uh, life cycles. <laughs> And we start here with dust and whatever that might be out blown out into the intergalactic space that means uh, that milky way loses it but milky way also recycles intergalactic gas gas coming in mostly uh towards here the inside so we built then Obviously, this is a dynamical system. Dynamical means that usually you also get somewhere clumps and, and you have a bottleneck and you accumulate a bit more. So, and of course, then you can also have this in the interstellar medium. And now you have, of course, somewhere a gas cloud with a common center of gravity. You might now start that the center of gravity starts attracting. So this works first of all. This is this common gravity works against this wanting to wanting to expand of the gas cloud. Otherwise, you would disperse the, the gas cloud and uh, forget about any formation of any star. So there must be something happening that the gas cloud starts to have sufficient mutual gravity of the molecules to start then contracting. And then we might be able to contract enough to form a star. And depending on this initial ma mass this is so that we have available, maybe we might get stars or a bit heavier or a bit lighter. If there's not so much gas to the final product would be obviously a bit light. And this will be then the next week, 
And this here is in two weeks, the dying of stars. So supernova type two, type one, yeah, the, 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 the formation of what we call planetary nebula. So this is then coming next week. So what a small, how a small star behaves and what happens to him. What the large star behaves, but obviously there is something. Uh, how much material do you have available? <coughs> and at the beginning of time, we have learned. There came the dark the microwave background, then comes the dark ages. And then it took a while until about two hundred million years. At least we think so. Because of the redshift, we need now, Hubble couldn't see it. The other earthbound observatory can't see the infrared because it's absorbed. So we need now this uh, James Webb Space Telescope that has been now assembled. And it's hopefully soon going to be commissioned, what means tested. Then we probably see light from the first stars. It took about two, we think it took 200 million years. It might be more or less. We're going to see what is the redshift. After the Big Bang, we have a big universe or a universe that is already so expanded it's below 3000 Kelvin and cooling down, cooling down, cooling down for the next 200 million years. But we have, of course, loads of, we have now the hydrogen formed. We have now formed the helium a bit, but nothing really be beyond. That is not possible at the Big Bang condition. So this gas is now falling into the sinks provided by the dark matter. And now is the question, can we then talk about uh, already big accumulations and, and first galaxies that in which then the, the stars form or the first, first star form, first stars, you have a relatively dense cloud of, of, of hydrogen, what means you would expect to form relatively big stars. They, we're going to learn these are the rock stars, the fast are young and very violent. So, and leave them behind corpses like black holes, which then might feast and form the, the, the gravitational sink where you around form universes, uh, not universe, galaxies. Who knows? James Webb will tell us. So we had the first stars were relatively mass rich. There's a certain limit where a star directly collapses under its own gravity. This is about 130 times the mass of our sun. If the gas cloud has too much, then you form directly a black hole. No. But obviously hydrogen is not attracted and when we hopefully have the first stars running. Can we observe the hydrogen gas from this time? Yes. Aha, for once it works. Hydrogen has something very special. Oh, it's this one proton with this one neutron. And maybe you remember back there, but the spin half particles, they, they have this intrinsic rotation, whether clockwise. Then we would symbolize the clockwise motion by an arrow that points up, and the electron has the same. Is the definition of these fermions that form the matter. They always have this half integer spin. And the particles that transmit the, the, the forces, they have always this integer number of, of spin. Zero, one, two. But everything with three half, one half, half integer, this is the stuff that forms the matter. So they so called fermions after Enrico Fermi. So 
And this half a spin we would associate with some kind of intrinsic rotation. It can be clockwise and counterclockwise. So for sec, plus a half pointing up and minus a half pointing down. But the absolute would be a half. So now we can have proton and, and uh, electrons spin the same direction. But energetically favored is when they spin opposite. Why? These are no moving charges. Even this intrinsic rotation is a moving charge. Rotate around itself, a moving charge creates a magnetic field. And the magnetic field that is resulting is minimized a bit. In the magnetic field, you store some energy. In order to build up magnetic field, you have a current going. At the beginning, the current will create a voltage against itself. The so-called lens voltage or lens rule it works against the course. Otherwise, you have a self-amplifying self effect, and usually you get an explosion if you don't work against the course. So they build a magnetic field, and this is a bit minimum, and therefore you have less energy stored in this magnetic field if they are anti-aligned. So the, the one rotates clockwise and the other counterclockwise. And this corresponds to come from this state to this state to what we call a spin flip whoosh. We change a bit in energy, what means now you have a current distribution changed, what you get is a magnetic wave coming out, what means electromagnetic wave, what means light. And this energy that is then uh, associated with this difference of this orientation relative to each other corresponds to a, length, a wave is wavelengths of 21 centimeters. Once created, this state here lives for roughly 10 million years. to collide maybe to, to hydrogen uh, atoms and then you induce the spin flip oh, the other way around. Oh, no. Sorry. Wrong button. Switch off. No. Look. Oh, sorry. Don't know what happened now. Oh, let's quit. And then we establish. Hopefully, slideshow. Okay, so we basically have now this 21 centimeter line that is characteristic for hydrogen. So, nice thing. And we can measure gas. We can measure interstellar gas, we can measure intergalactic gas. Whether it's there one atom by meter, but you have so much of it. Then you can measure the Doppler shift, you can measure the redshift, and there we can measure from the redshift basically again that this must have been the, the hydrogen gas at the very beginning of time, or when this first stars formed. And these this is something we can measure with our radio telescopes. So even down on Earth. <clears throat> so essentially this small energy difference that is between this up and down state results in a wave. Or so nice characteristic for each, for each uh, hydrogen atom. Longer wavelengths, radio astronomy, radio astronomy, these big uh, bowls somewhere in the, in the mountains. So this here is the fast, the 500 meters aperture spherical telescope in Pingtang, China, started 2016. But also, uh, you, I think there are so many films that they are there to be shown. Of course, you need here on the bottom an outlet, otherwise you have soon the lake. Oh. 
So it's quite impressive. And with them, we can now do hydro uh, map this hydrogen 21 centimeter long. So problem, of course, usually uh, in the radio wave, <laughs> it loads around. So you should go to an area which is a bit more remote or best in one of these valleys where you are shielded basically against all radio and TV signals. Usually a nuisance if you live there, but now for this kind of guys, obviously, <laughs> they need to take uh, their videos with them when they go there for longer observation periods. So radio astronomy, that's quite nice. And because of the redshift, we get even longer wavelengths than this 21 centimeter. And the flip, as I said, this happens once. It, once pre created, it takes about 10 million years to have this flip. So we can observe this gas thanks to this 21 centimeters. Nowadays, stars form forming regions we would again associate with nebulas. It means accumulation of gases. And this is, for example, one nebula, that's the Crab Nebula. This is not a star forming region. It's in fact, this is the, the graveyard of a star. Other nebula, there would be planetary nebula, but they are again in two, three lectures. This is again a graveyard, or this is basically interstellar space. This star is basically dying at the moment, and what you see here is already the remnant is a white morph in the center, and then around it's surrounded by hydrogen gas. Mostly hydrogen, a bit of helium, and traces of whatever it during its lifetime. And we see nicely that this obviously has been emitted in, in a type of, in a series of different flashes. That's called uh, the Cat's Eye Nebula. There are plenty of these uh, planetary nebula and they're very nice objects. So there is always some underlying symmetry, which is really nice to, to look at. Be careful with the colors because they have been all they don't color. Then here, this would be the Pro Nebula, another graveyard, another remnant. But we see already here also another feature. This is now real colors, red, blue. That seems to be here dominating. Same if you look in the Eagle Nebula. Well, if you look here, that might be, it looks a bit like an eagle. Well, Perhaps if you, after the next rave you have attended, if in the morning, look, take a look at this photograph, you might uh, see a bit more. But people have seen here an, an eagle, so it's the eagle nebula. Again, a bit this is, 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 is violet reddish. But here again, we need to be a bit cautious because with the colors in astronomy, well, and then in there is a very interesting region. You see these darker spots. Dark means either there is nothing or it's so dense we cannot have any light that shines through. And it does not emit too much in the, electro, in the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Oops. If it's very dense, it might be rather cool. So, okay, and this stuff in here that is uh, now a bit twisted the other way around, these are called the pillars of creation. So, this is a region, creation. Well, you can either be in Kentucky in the go there in a certain museum, which is run by people that believe that the Earth is 11,000 years old or 9,000 years old. But this means rather here is something created. In fact, this is a very, very active star forming region. This is a star nursery. Another star nursery is nicely shown here in this film, which I 
I think it, uh, it, it links to YouTube. So if I now open this, it makes causes pro uh, problems for me. So I would now, anyway, stop here this video because I need also to go and pick up my boy. But also, I let you enjoy this video. So stop this one and, and click in the lecture slide on the link. You will see a video by the ESA where you zoom into what is called the Orion Nebula. Orion, you probably already know, this is constellation with the three close lying stars. At the moment, if you look in the night sky at around 10 o'clock, it's in the southern direction. So if there's a nice evening, not too many, all no clouds, you have the chance to see it, take a look at it. You will find the three stars, the belt of Orion. And one of this at the back, there is then, if one takes a good telescope, one sees a nebula. That's Orion Nebula. And then you zoom here in, in, into, and then what you see in the Orion Nebula, the so called Horsehead Nebula. To me, it looks rather like a cobra. But first, you look at it in the uh, optical, and you see again blackness. But then uh, towards the end, it changes, I think, towards the, the infrared. And then you can see with the infrared, you can see through the gas. What you see is, is very hot spheres. This is another region of active star formation. Another nursery. And I would let you know, enjoy this. And then hopefully you zoom in for the next video towards when we look a bit more in the properties of these nebulas and then how stars form from these nebulas. See you then.